So uh, we are very happy to welcome Christina and listen to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the gener very generous introduction. And thanks to Julia, Peter, and Candice in particular, and everyone in the department for allowing me to come to SOAS. Having the chance to, of sharing um, that which my research focused on last year is a great opportunity for me. Uh, I wouldn't say that I'm an expertise of lingua franca, but I have been working on lingua franca thanks to this project that I'm going to introduce or to present to you today. Um, well, uh, just uh, a quick preview of my talk. I'm going to start uh, by introducing you to the general project which um, this research is part of, the corpus and subcorpus of um, which I worked. The historical background in order to contextualize the documents that I have been analyzing and the writers, the analysis of the documents and then the conclusion. Well, let's start from the general project. The general project, the title uh, is Linguistic Representations of Identity, Social Linguistic Models and Historical Linguistics and the scientific coordinator was Piera Molinelli, University of Bergamo. These are the members of my unit where I worked in Viterbo. Turchetta Barbara, that was the scientific coordinator, and then Laura Mori, Maria Rosaria Zinzi, Margherita Di Salvo. And I'm that um, um, to them for some of the information that I'm going to present both today and on the next. Well, this, um, in this uh, project, what we did it was to study the linguistic variation and the language varieties in use in the Mediterranean area, the beginning of the early modern age, paying attention to the writing system in use among writers as well as the linguistic variation. So our corpus that we collected in the State Archive of Venice is made of uh, seven different collections which um, date back to 15, 16, 17 and 18 centuries. But for my research I focus just on documents of 16 and 17 century. The first six um, collection um, have been directly collected in the State Archive. That means I went there with Barbara Turchetta and we took copies of the documents and then we transcribed the documents. And the last one is this, uh, this one. It's available online and it's part of another project that is called Divenire. And it was uh, where Maria Pedani Fabris worked and you can go online and you can go through it. What you find is there this kind of documents, okay? So <clears throat> what uh, the objective, our objective was to, um, to show what the Romans used in these documents was. So what was the variety of Italian language used? Mm hypothesizing that possible social linguistic parameters would have been what? So the typology of text, um, who the writer, who was the writer to, um, who wrote the text, where the place where the writer wrote the text, and to whom, so the addressing. And all this intertwined with the historical period, so with some changes related to the historical period in which these texts were um, written. Hence, I, I can go back to the presentation, sorry. Okay. So, um, what I did was to adopt, at the beginning, I adopted a qualitative and quantitative methodological framework, and I was looking for these uh, traits. Um, since the documents were, I mean, the document involved the presence of a Venetian subject, or they were documents, which moved between Constantinople and Venice um, in the 16th and 17th century, I took into consideration the linguistic futures which defined the Venetian language. Then those linguistic futures which have been recognized as being characteristic of uh, the northern Italian koine. And then um, since uh, a previous study carried out by Daniele Baglioni uh, among, about the documents of Tunisi chan uh, Chancellery uh, demonstrated that the language variety used um, was uh, mainly the Toscan variety of Italian language. I took into consideration also some threats of the Toscan Romans. And since in the Mediterranean area there was, 
I mean, it was the place where Lingua Franca developed. I took also into consideration the traits for all Lingua Franca. So I was, what I did it was to look for all these traits inside the world corpus, the, the documents of the world corpus. But um, I must be sincere that the, um, well, the idea, uh, what was, the idea was that I wouldn't have found Tuscan Roman threads, but I, have, I would have found more Venetian or Northern Italian coinate, uh, threads in comparison with the documents which were wrote in the, written in, the, um, in Tunisia. But um, at the beginning, when I finished this collection of data, I felt as to be in front of this kind of painting, mm -hmm. where all those points that, um, on the canvas were giving something and were connected and shaped into an image, but it, um, in which it seemed to be difficult to understand what perspective should be adopted in order to decipher them and to focus on the image behind them. Each perspective, like the language contact or the interference from non-Roman L1 or Roman Italian dialect interferences seemed valid. But at the same time, it seemed that they could not be applied in a systematic and absolute way to the world corpus. Indeed, the majority of variants occurred in a discontinuous way and the threats appeared to be without um, a social linguistic motivation and the variants seem to overlap also within the same text and with reference to the same vari variable. For this reason, um, however, among the wall threads there were some um, uh, threads which I have defined plus anti-Tuscan threads, so which were representative of, or, um, uh, of the Venetian language or Northern Italian Koine. Um, I saw that this kind, uh, this kind of threads uh, seem to be a constant presence in some specific kinds of documents of the world corpus. And those um, documents which were contained mainly in these two sets, mm? so contained in the Turkish letters and writings, and then contained in the miscellany of Turkish documents. Consequently, what I did it was to select 66 documents within this uh, subcorpus, to which I added these further two documents. I haven't worked on this, I haven't transcribed this, but uh, this is um, a text um, edited in 1969 by Giorgio Raimondo Cardona, and this is, uh, these are texts of another writer, which I'm going to introduce soon, um, which was edited and published by Rotman. I forgot to tell you before that the total amount of documents that have been collected in the State Archive of Venice was 1,436 documents, and this documents have all been typed, digitalized. I wrote, <laughs> me, Margherita Di Salvo, and in the last part of the project, Renzo Jacobucci, that is a paleograph, um, we transcribed all the text, the, the same text that I showed you before. So it took uh, really a huge time. But well, uh, among this uh, world corpus, I selected 66 uh, texts uh, taken from this two set of, col uh, this, um, two set of collection. So um, I, what I did at that point was I questioned what they had in common, looking for something which could explain why some threads were more recurrent here than in other collections, why some specific threads only, uh, could only be found here and not in the others or anyway in a higher quantity here than in the other collections. <coughs> Those I looked at the typology of text, so I saw what kind of texts were inside these two collections, and there were translations, there were petitions, there were commercial letters, but not too many. Mainly, there were letters between the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire and the Doge in Venice. And then the content of this text could be uh, text um, where they were defining the borders of land or battles or, I don't know, some bureaucratic and administrative issue. Then um, they were translations of diplomatic documents written mainly in Persian or Greek or Arabic, as well as private letters between the Ottoman Sultan and some trusted man. Then what I did was I tried to identify the writer because 
if, if we, don't, uh, we don't have any, con any knowledge about the writer, it can be difficult to uh, arrive at uh, an interpretation of the data that you find. So I tried to identify the writer and um, of course I made my uh, life easier taking those texts which were written by some specific writer and which was quite easy to identify because they are those uh, members that in the Ottoman Empire worked as interpreters and they are, which are called dragomans. For this you have dragomans in the title of this presentation. <coughs> so the majority of them were specific subjects as interpreters at the Ottoman Empire, but they also worked not only in the Ottoman Empire as interpreters for the Sultan and the Bailo, but also in the, um, they worked for the Venetian Board of Trade in Venice. So what they did, they were interpreters for Ottomans who visited Venice. Okay, And then they also worked in um, uh, for um, specifically only for the Bailo or the Doge in, uh, in Venice. Consequently, <clears throat> so at this point, my objective became to demonstrate that the linguistic variation found in this text were first of all determined by the lack of a written model of reference in the Levant, and where the Tuscan romance wasn't the prestigious variety. And therefore, my hypothesis was that Dragoman's variation could be interpreted as a representative of a social act. <clears throat> there is a reason for which, but I will, uh, why I thought about the social act. But before showing you the analysis, I would like to give you some historical background uh, of where these texts were produced and some biographical information about the writers. What you have here, it is a, a map of the Venetian commercial routes. Um, so, and uh, when uh, uh, we can date the birth of Venice as an independent province back to the year 829, when the Doge nominated himself as a Dux, uh, Dux Venetigorum determined Venice's independence from Byzantium. According to Friedrich, the history of Venetian economic expansion can be identified in three different periods. However, what is more important for me and uh, for this map is uh, the period um, of the Second Crusade when Venice moved to the Levant and when um, the papacy decided to be helped by Venice in the Second Crusade. And then what Venice did was to put the ships, but they never reached the Holy, uh, the Holy Land because Venice uh, moved towards those areas in which it, uh, it was interested uh, for its commercial um, expansion. So the 1204 is the year of the Second Crusade and um, in, in, and it is the same here of the birth of the ephemeral Latin Oriental Empire and the triumph of Venice, which became the uncontested commercial intermediary between the West and the East. Starting for, uh, from the 13th century, thus, Venice established its colonies on the Istrian and Dalmatian coast, so here, and then established um, colonies here on this uh, side of Greece, and then in Candia and in Cyprus, and then Venice arrived also on the Black Sea, and of course Constantinople or uh, Istanbul was one of the main um, colony of Venice, where Venice had its uh, commercial um, exchange. So. While the Latin um, Oriental Empire um, existed, the Venetian delegate was the Podesta. And then this same figure of the Podesta was substituted later uh, by the Bailo, a figure that is called the Bailo, that was in the Ottoman uh, uh, Porta, and uh, who was, uh, I mean, the person in charge for the uh, diplomatic uh, relation with the Ottoman Empire. <coughs> As soon as uh, um, the Ottoman Empire started to, to spread, the power of Venice reduced, and then Venice was get lo losing uh, lands. And it was in that moment that for Venice became really extremely important to maintain 
as better as possible relationship with the Ottoman Empire. And it is in the same, in this same period that these uh, professionalized figures appeared, the dragomans. I mean, they were officialized as interpreters because their, their duty uh, went beyond the uh, simple uh, work of translators. They were those people, those intermediary subjects between Venice and Constantinople who made possible the relationships uh, between Venice and uh, the Ottoman Sultan or on the contrary who could would have the power of destroy it because it depends how they translated the documents they could change or shape <laughs> the text in a different way. So <clears throat> In, uh, in, this, uh, in this area, this is, is Constantinople, and starting from the 13th centuries, here in Pera, a community of Italian, uh, represented by Genoese and Venetians, uh, settled. And like this, there were many other communities where Venice, what did, uh, Venice uh, used to bring Venetian people directly there and to live there. So there were these small communities of Venetian or Genoese who settled in the Levant and who lived in this, um, in this context. However, in this mass of relationships, and connections, uh, Venice became a crucial center for linguistic and cultural exchange, both in Italy and here in the Levant. <coughs> and it is within this scenario that's, that these figures, the dragomans, appeared. So in, uh, starting from the um, mid-16th centuries, there was an important distinction between the people who were just interpreters and those figures who were dragomans. Because the dragomans were the professionalized interpreters, the official interpreters for the sultan and the doge. Hmm? <clears throat> Dragomans did not exist only Levant, in the Levant, so they were also in Tunisia, but as Baglioni says, they were quite different, these two figures, and the dragomans in Tunisia were not so important as they were in uh, the Levant side. So, <coughs> dragoman is uh, one of the many Romance variants of an Arabic word for dragoman, tarjuman, and which passed through the Turkish language. And as Rotman says, the term appears in Latin notary records from Genoese colonies of Pera, that I showed you before, and Kaffa on the Black Sea, as early as um, 12, um, 1280. It is, um, its Italian cognates, dragoman or dragomanno, appear in Venetian and other Italian diplomatic records starting in the late 15th century. Hence, the dragoman was the interpreter who had the duty to carry out the diplomatic relations between the Sultan and the Ottoman Empire and the Doge in Venice, when the most serene Republic of Venice had the need to maintain good relationship with the Ottoman Empire and when many Venetians lived in communities in the Levant like Pera. So, <clears throat> They translated, these are, this is another picture of Dragomans, and this is a website where the main information about Dragomans have been uh, collected is actually from Rotman, who studied uh, deeply this figure. And these are the Ottoman Firmani that they used to translate. So in that archive that I showed you before online, you have the original document, which is or in Arabic or in Persian or written in Greek, and then the correspondent translation. <clears throat> so the job, their job had multiple roles, as dragomans were interpreters and translators, but also, most importantly, they were intermediaries between two words, two cultures, and two languages. <clears throat> They were trans-imperial trans subjects who had to mediate between two different cultural models, which they knew very well. Dragomans were both praised and scorned, and their work was physically and mentally hard. They were frequently exposed to different kinds of dangerous situations, and many times they paid with their own lives. It was for this reason that their work um, was admired by many. However, since for many of them, becoming a dragoman corresponded to an improvement in their social position, above all in the Levant, and at the beginning of the establishment of this profession, they were also looked upon with suspicion. In fact, they were often considered opportunists and social climbers. Because of this, several bylaws complained about having to speak through the dragomans, especially in Divan. 
Dragomans became the filters through which bailers and sultans had to express themselves, and they could not be sure that dragomans could be trusted. However, it was in the origin of the dragomans that would determine how, uh, determine how faithful they were. In fact, dragomans belonged to two different contexts. Context. Some of them came from Venetian families, others were Venetian subjects in the Stato della Damar, so in the Levant, and the <coughs> in the Venetian colonies like Pera, while others were subject of the Sultan. The Sultan. According to Bruni, the majority of dragomans at the Porte were of Greek origins, and those of Greek origins used to work for Turkey, um, for Turks. <coughs> They, there, were just, there were three different bases of recruitment for uh, dragomans. The young people of, um, among the Venetian citizens, and they, were formed, they could be formed in Venice or they could be sent to the Levant in order to learn the uh, Oriental languages. Then the colonial nobility of the Adriatic and the Eastern Mediterranean, and then the Venetians in the Latin community of Pera. <coughs> Thus, the dragomans could be Dalmatian, Venetian of Dalmatian or Venetian origins, or they could be Cypriot, Greek, or of Turkish origin as well. However, above, uh, all dragomans, above all those uh, who lived in the Levant, belonged to an operative community within which they gradually started to transfer their profession in a linear way of generation. So the first dragoman started as a... Um, mm, uh, as an interpreter, I mean, it was just by chance that the first dragoman that I'm going to analyze, Chivran, became a dragoman. He was recognized as a dragoman. <coughs> it's uh, only later the profession was uh, recognized and uh, as an official profession. And then in this um, in this context, the um, community of dragomans gained prestigious in the became more prestigious in the Levant community and the dragomans uh, starting to transfer uh, became an endogamous, endogamous community and they started to transfer their profession in uh, in a linear <coughs> in a linear way <coughs> However, independently from what their specific duties were, dragomans belonged to this highly endo endogamous micro-community whose borders were fluid and could extend or reduce according to the perspective from which they were considered. <coughs> well, I, in considering them, I took uh, Rotman's perspective into consideration according to which dragomans were actors who straddled and brokered, and thus helped to shape political, religious, and linguistic boundaries between the early modern Ottoman and the Venetian states. Well, these are, <coughs> I took into consideration five different dragomans, of which you find some information here. They belong to uh, two different historical periods, 16th and 17th century, and um, they, are, um, they share some peculiarities and they differ from others. For example, uh, the first one, Girolamo Civran and Michele Membre, they were not part of the, communi uh, of the Venetian community of Pera because they, the first one was born in Metoni and the second one was born in Cyprus, <coughs> while the last three, Giacomo Denores, Tommaso Tarsia, and Giacomo Tarsia, they were part of the Venetian community of Pera. Then uh, Girolamo Civran and Giacomo Denores had spent, both of them, their childhood among Turks because they were, um, they, they had, um, uh, they um, were stolen by Turks uh, from their community, and it was in this way that they learned the uh, Arabic and Persian language, or the Turkish language. <coughs> then uh, they, um, Tommaso and Giacomo Tarsia, they were bor uh, born um, uh, in Dalmatia, and they were uh, members of a noble family, as well as Giacomo de Norris, mm -hmm. while Michele Membre and Girolamo Civran were not noble, uh, they did not belong to a noble family. <coughs> so, uh, what else about them? And then their linguistic repertoire, uh, repertoire the, as you can see, the Girolamo Civran as Greek, as well as Membre and de Norris, they knew Greek because they were all. Um, um, they all grew up in, um, or in Cyprus or in Metoni. And then 
They have Italian and, for example, according to Pedani Fabris, Giacomo de Norris learned the Italian language only when he, was, um, he moved to Venice again. So he, 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 was, uh, he was born into an Italian family, a Venetian family, but he had forgotten the language and then he was learning the Italian language again when he moved uh, to Venice. And, uh, so these futures which characterize the, uh, the dragomans have been taken into consideration as, um, possi as possible uh, um, sociolinguistic parameters for um, interpreting the linguistic variation. The hypothesis um, was that the birth and the establishing of the community of dragomans at the social level corresponded also to an establishing at the linguistic level of a dragoman socialite. A stylist canon representative of these specific figures in their historical geographical context. Furthermore, I, what I thought is that the occurrence of Venetian or Northern Kone linguistic futures or threats could have varied according to the addressee of the correspondence as well as the typology of the written document. Consequently, the aim was to explain and motivate the dragoman's linguistic behavior in correlation to these sociolinguistic parameters, which are those which I underlined before. To be or not be characterized by captivity among Turks, to be or not be part of the Venetian community of Pera, um, the languages in the, that they knew, the place where they worked, to be or not to be part of a noble um, family, and the typology of document that uh, they wrote. <clears throat> this, um, this idea about, uh, the, um, about considering uh, the possibility to find out a social act among dragomans, it was also um, sustained by the fact that dragomans, as you have already seen in the previous image, were identified uh, by their aesthetic uh, aspect because they used to wear some specific habits. And these are the paintings uh, where <coughs> uh, there is the representation of the duty of dragomans in, uh, at the Sultan Ottomans, and they were <coughs> at the Sultan co uh, court. And uh, what they, they are always displayed as um, members which wear some specific costumes, which some specific elements, such as the woolen gowns with a fur, uh, fur collar and the dark cap, which is, well, uh, which is uh, called uh, kalpak. And they were a sign, all these were a sign of non-Muslim dragomans. So these were recognized as those dragomans who worked in the connection between Venice, so the West, uh, the West and the East, the Ottoman Empire. <coughs> well, these are other paintings representing the <coughs> dragomans. So let's uh, move to the analysis and uh, linguistic analysis. What I thought, I took as possible social linguistic variants um, some graphic uh, um, elements at the graphic and phonological and morphology, uh, morphology level, and I looked into uh, lexemes. So at the graphic level, I took into consideration the graphic alternation, allography, and the presence or absence of Latin graphemes as a representative of a more um, diplomatic um, typology of text or as a more representative of a more conservative uh, writing. At a phonological level, I looked into the detongization, metaphony, treatment of affricates, voicing and the voicing of intervocalic stops, and <coughs> and the gemination. At the morphological level, I looked at the alternation between the article um, L, uh, realized as L, or the article realized as il, and then I looked also at the realization of the article realized as I, or, uh, or better, as E and Li. Then I looked at the alternation between me and t versus e, io, tu um, as a subject. I looked at the alternation of the preposition in the form of de or in the form of the. 
I looked at the um, uh, realization as synthetic versus analytic articulated preposition. And then I looked at the occurrence of the clitic C in the infinitive reflexive construction. I looked at the apocopate past participle and at the first plural um, uh, person um, verbs in emo instead of yamo, like facemo instead of facciamo. And then I looked at the occurrence of subjunctive fusse, fussero and at the occurrence of così or Così, uh, così, and then um, I looked at uh, the presence of Latinism or of uh, typically Venetian lexemes. These are those threats uh, that I at the beginning I have defined as a representative of the Venetian variety of language and uh, as a representative of the northern Koine, Italian Koine. So <coughs> I <coughs> These linguistic threads have been, uh, these have been selected because they are representative of these uh, two linguistic aspects. For example, as a Thomasin argued, the presence of the voiceless velar and alveolar stop and of voiced alveolar stop is one of the main differences between Tuscan and the Venetian variety. Furthermore, in Venetian Romans, there is the tendency to maintain the voiceless stop of Latin origin like in Patron. These threads are also typical of the Northern Romance varieties to which Sangha, as well as Tomasin, refers as Lombard language or Northern Italian Koine. Rolfs too states that in the Northern Itali Italy, um, Italian Koine, the voiced alveolar stop is general mute in the Western area, while it is restored in the Eastern one, where there is voicing of in the intervocalic stop. Consequently, these linguistic features have been selected consider considering the Venetian variety as well as the Venetian exported in the Levant, so the Venetian language of uh, the La Damar. <coughs> Due to the fact that the subjects involved in the analyzed text were mainly Venetians, only the Venetians northern threat have been considered here. But as I showed before, I looked and I observed also other threats which are representative of Tuscan. So, what was the distribution of these threats among the dragomans? As you can see in the, in the handout that I gave you, in the point A, you have the distribution of threats, which are, <coughs> we find common threats, um, it's possible to find common threats among all the five dragomans, then distinctive threats of, uh, which are representative of those dragomans like Chivran and Membre, representative of the 16th century, then threads which um, can be identified as northern Italian Kone threads and Venetian threads, and then farther, a further differentiation between Chivran and Membre itself. So there is, um, <coughs> and I, I gave, um, in A1 uh, you have the common threads among the five dragomans, where I give you the examples, the occurrence that I found in the text. Then in A2, you have the distinctive traits of Chivran and Membre, which, uh, which are those threats that are only found in Chivran and Membre and not in the other dragomans. <coughs> then um, you have uh, in point five and six, those threats which differentiate Chivran and Membre, even though they belong to the same, uh, to the same period. <coughs> So what uh, the, the first, I mean, at, at the first sight, what happened that looking, looking for those uh, threats representative of Venetian or Northern Koine variety, it appeared that the mm, uh, dragomans belonging to the first period, so to the 16th centuries, differed from the uh, dragomans belonging to the 17th, 17th century. So, and this, of course, can be explained from a diachronic perspective, but let's go ahead and let we see what happened at the morpho morphological level. We have um, the, um, I have looked into the alternation of the article, El Il. Well, uh, regarding uh, this, these forms, so, <clears throat> Regarding the singular el il lo versus and the plural i il, what um, what uh, I think it's important to say is that the form li, so for the plural instead of i, would conform to a bureaucratic pan Indian uh, pan Italian sorry usage. In fact, while i is a specific mark of the notary writing in Venice. 
Lee seems to mark the bureaucratic writing in the Mediterranean chancelleries, and it was also found in Baglioni. The analyzed texts have demonstrated a higher occurrence of Lee in all dragomans, and you have here, so the percentage of occurrence uh, for Li is higher than the occurrence of I. So we can, we can say that this um, linguistic future show that their writing was a bureaucratic writing in uh, um, contraposition to other writings which present this other <coughs> variant. The analyzed um, more problematic is, was to explain uh, this uh, um, alternation between il and el, because uh, first of all, I would have expected to find the form lo, which is typical of Venetian language, but it was absent in the, in the text. And then uh, what I found, it was only alternation between el and il. <coughs> According to Rolf um, and Renzi, uh, il law were distributed in the Tuscan uh, romans according to the phonetic of the sentence. However, due to the interference from southern and the western dialects, the L form penetrated also in the Florence romans, but it, it became the only, um, it penetrated in the, in the uh, romans Florence, but it never established above il. And it, it was, uh, while in the Venetian um, in the romans, it became the most um, used article in the form of L instead of il. In the distribution of the variant L in the analyzed um, Dragoman text demonstrated an higher occurrence of the variant L for Chivran. And then, as we expected from a diachronic point, um, uh, historical point of view, we have no occurrences of L, and we find only il, il for the two Tarsia brothers and for the Norris. What, were, what surprised here it was Membre, because Membre belonged to the uh, 16th century as well as Chivran, and I would have expected the same linguistic behavior for this, uh, this article. But <clears throat> what, uh, what happened, I, as I told you at the beginning, I do not only consider those texts in Divenire um, um, archive, but I also took into consideration the Relazione di Persia, Persia that Membre wrote in 1540 and that he sent, he wrote and he sent to the Doge. So he didn't translate the text, he was writing a text. And in this context, when he was writing a text, what we have, what happened, that the only occurrence that we find is L. So this I mean, this data is going to, uh, are going to change. If we look at the typology of text, when Membre was working as interpreter and was translating the documents, so from a, um, Arabic or Persian into Italian, he was using the il. While he was writing his uh, relation, he was writing uh, using the L. So the L is representative of the Venetian variety in contraposition to the Toscan um, il, occurrence of il. So <coughs> this is... Um, uh, this is what uh, emerged from, uh, from the... Uh, uh, from the analysis uh, of the text. <coughs> then, if we look at the occurrence of uh, the alternance between uh, the and the, and then from the synthetic versus analytic form, again, um, we have uh, something which, uh, which is similar to what the um, graphic and script uh, um, data told us, that there is a difference between Chivran and Membre, and the Norris and Tarsia is, looks like if there was um, a cut between these two, uh, these two group, um, group, uh, groups of dragomans. And regarding the synthetic versus analytic preposition, so delli, delle, that is the uh, synthetic realization versus de, li, o de, le, what we have is for all the dragomans, here we have a common behavior for which the synthetic realization was, um, was used. And it has um, been demonstrated, uh, for example, in studies that 
Once uh, at that time it was used the synthetic uh, realization, so delli, delle, della, degli, etc. Uh, this in the, in the handwriting instead of the analytic form. This was representative of um, the uh, oral uh, orality, uh, which had a predominance on the. Uh, on the writing. And in fact, the analytic de li o de le is, uh, it would have been considered century later, um, centuries later as uh, the um, classic form or the more prestigious form. So the synthetic variation, the synthetic variant was more representative of the oral discourse than the analytic one which was more representative of the writing uh, of the writing style so in this uh, in this aspect the five dragomans behave in the same um, in the same way so <clears throat> Um, furthermore, uh, the um, Baglioni, for example, in its analysis of um, uh, text uh, written in Tunisia, uh, in the Regencies, uh, states that the analytic representation of uh, figurative preposition is typical of text produced um, uh, representative of a simplified um, um, uh, Italian language uh, in comparison to the other, as if uh, you recognize it as one thread of those uh, of that simplified Italian language used in the Mediterranean. So, and this uh, seems to not occur for these uh, five um, dragomans. Then, um, regarding the the other. Um, considered sociolinguistic variables that you have in the last point of the endout, that is uh, point, uh, letter B. So the, as you can see again, there is uh, a catch between um, <clears throat> Uh, a separation between Civran and Membre in comparison with the uh, uh, Tarsia brothers. But here in this context, what, um, uh, what is uh, interesting is Denores, which is uh, Denores is that dragoman who was living between the 16th and the 17th century. So he was in the middle of these two periods, which are representative of Civran and Membre on one side and of Tarsia on the other side. And Denores, even though he presented, um, he behaved mostly as the later dragomans like Tarsia, he had some uh, future, linguistic futures that uh, can be compared to those who characterized Civran and Membre. And once again, what is interesting is that these linguistic futures, uh, I mean, when the Norris uh, go, uh, goes closer to Civran and Membre, is not writing translation, so is not translating documents, but again, is writing some documents which are um, written directly by him. And these kind of documents are the petitions or the pleas that uh, the uh, Norris sent uh, send to the Doge. So, to sum up what we have, we have that uh, two groups um, which are differentiated um, and the register linguistic variation seems uh, to be related to the following sociolinguistic parameters. So we have on one side a plus anti-Tuscan uh, plus Venetian uh, be linguistic behaviors where there are threats, uh, threats which occur alongside the presence of um, at least of one of the following parameters. I mean, for those writers who are characterized at least one by one or more of these parameters, we have a, a plus anti-Tuscan plus Venetian linguistic behavior. While for those, um, for those writers which are characterized by these other uh, threads, we have a linguistic behaviors which move toward an anti-Tuscan or a minus Venetian, okay? Minus anti-Tuscan, minus Venetian. So <coughs> what I want to say is that if the writer that we consider it was characterized by having been captured by Turks or he is not uh, writing um, a translation, uh, not only writing a typology of text which fit inside the translation, if he cannot be considered as a proper Venetian because he, although he was living in the community of Pera, but he had 
um, a story of life which um, bring him far from to be Venetian. If he wasn't uh, belonging to a noble status family, so this um, in uh, in his uh, language that the, he used in the text, uh, we find a more threat linguistic features which are which can be considered anti-Tuscan or and, and can be considered as Venetian threads. For those writers that, on the contrary, were not captured by Turks when they were child, and they were proper Venetian because they are recognized as a Venetian, as belonging to the most serene republic of um, Venice group. If they are member of a noble, noble status family, and if the texts are translation, and if they belong to the historical period, period of 17th century, so the linguistic behavior that we find is that they are more oriented toward what uh, toward that language which would have been uh, recognized as a standard language later in Italy. So they are more oriented toward the Toscan variety there than the others, even though they do not show a Toscan variety in their text. There are more threats which are closer to the Tuscan variety than to the Venetian variety. So <clears throat> consequently, in my opinion, what emerged um, from the analysis of these five Dragoman's writings, he said uh, there is a linguistic differentiation we should be considered in a diachronic perspective, since the linguistic variation follows the linguistic change with the language in Italy uh, and those in the courts was undergoing and conforming more and more to the Tuscan variety of the language. And this is demonstrated by uh, both the linguistic behavior of Tarsia brothers and partially in the Norris, which is um, uh, who is the dragomance on the border between the two. There is a social linguistic variation which is evident at the level of writing as well as of the language. And this social linguistic variation seems to be strictly connected to the social linguistic parameters considered for our analysis. Above all, the parameters which refer to be or not to be to proper Venetian, what uh, I mean, what I showed you um, in, the previous, uh, in the previous slide. And what I wondered is, um, I mean, what I questioned is how, how this can be interpreted, considering that apart from Chivran and Membre and the Norris, these Venetian threads are more evident in those texts which are not included within the translation typology. I mean, um, what, what I noticed that um, not only Chivran and Membre were characterized by Venet more Venetian threads, but also that when the Norris had a more Venetian linguistic uh, behavior, it was um, I, I, I found um, it was uh, writing another text that was different from the translation. So he was writing his own text, his own correspondence. So this is uh, the what is common between Membre and the Norris. Again, if we take uh, if you remember Membre in the behavior of the alternation between L and il. Whenever he writes a translation, we find the, um, the, the occurrence of il, which is representative of a more Toscanized variety of the language. Whenever we find um, the occurrence of L, we have a text which is more Venetian oriented. And in, mem in, uh, in Membre, this um, variant was uh, much more present in the relation that he wrote to the doge, so it is not um, a translation. So the typology of text, as well as the content of the text, and as well as the um, address of the text, seem to have a role in this, um, in this variation. And so what I would like to suggest is that this can be read as an, a kind of negotiation of um, belonging to a group or belonging to another group or to be recognized in a group or to be recognized in another group. When writing both, in fact, it is because uh, when writing both the report and the pleas in order to be trusted and falling into the category of dragomans who were not strictly connected with Ottomans, rather to Venetians, both Membre and Norris felt the need to be identified as members of the Venetian collectivity. Within this perspective, their writings became representative of writers' capacity to establish a relation which, uh, with his reader, in this case, the Doge. In this context, 
the writing, uh, the, so the text, the written text, should be considered as an effort to establish a common and shared background with a symbolic or informative function between the writer and the reader. Hence, the message content and the address determine, determine Dragoman's writing style. And in this context, the relation between the writer and the reader implies a common and a shared use of an oral and written code, which assumes the value of an identity marker. In other words, in terms, um, it turns into a kind of act of identity or of identification. Naturally, the selection of linguistic items and varieties by the Dragomans, both both culturally or socially oriented, is unconsciously produced. However, it is used by them to identify themselves within a group. Hence, although it was not possible to confirm the hypothesis, the original um, hypothesis about the existence of a dragoman social act, because we have seen that all these threads are not common to all the dragomans for which we, could, uh, we can um, uh, uh, identify a social act. <coughs> Um, it has been possible to identify those dragomans for which the linguistic variation can be interpreted as a social practice adopted in order to show a status of belonging to a group. Therefore, when these dragomans were working in the role of intermediaries and writing diplomatic documents, their behavior emphasizes um, less specific Venetian features, while when they needed to establish a functional relation with the Doge, their socially oriented behavior moved them toward a more Venetian variety of the language. However, considering that dragomans characterized by the anti-Toscan and Venetian threads are exclusively represented by two, because we have only found these uh, kinds of threads in Chivran and Membre and only partially in the Norris. And uh, considering that they belong to the, both belong to the 16th centuries while the Nore, the Norris is um, between 16th and 17th centuries. Um, and contrary also that Tarsia brothers, uh, for whom the minus anti-Toscan threads are more valid, belong to the 17th centuries. So taking into account that <coughs> Um, all this uh, consideration, how it also interpret this data as the exemplification of the status that the Italian language had in the Levant. Not only it was the language used in, in, in chancelleries between the Ottomans and Venetians, but it was also the communicative code used pragmatically by these people. Thus, neither Venetian Romance dialect nor Tuscan Romance dialect were the exclusive varieties. Rather, the Italian language was represented by Romance varieties which moved along a continuum. Vari varieties colored with Venetian threads, but not identifiable with uh, a specific one. Hence, in the Levant, is not a dominion, uh, there is not a dominion of a dialect above another one or of a variety above another one, but there is a mobile and iridescent variety of language which adapts uh, to the situation, to the content of the text, and to the address of the correspondence. In fact, all Tartia's brothers are much more or less Venetians than the other considered writers. Their writing cannot in any case be regarded as a representative of a Tuscan variety. In their text, too, there are many different elements which allow us to judge the Italian in the Levant as a variety of language characterized by an overlapping of different linguistic futures. Consequently, all these linguistic variations should be taken as being due to the lack of a reference model which could interest the Dragoman in the Levant. It is for this reason that it would seem pointless to define what exactly the variety of language in use among the Dragoman was. On the contrary, the continuum which uh, emerges within the Dragoman's writing as well as in the um, world corpus that have been collected and was, uh, that was analyzed elsewhere gives a different picture of the Mediterranean as well as of the lands on it. They were characterized by a rich ecology and as Drastra observes, the reason to this rich ecology Early modern Mediterranean composite polities necessarily embraced practices of linguistic pragmatism that made no attempt to efface these linguistic differences or to impose any form of monolingual homogeneity on their empires. This should not only be considered true in consideration of different languages, but also in consideration of different varieties of the same language. In this case, 
Ita the Italian language. It is not possible to imagine that the Bembo model was spreading, uh, that w which was spreading in Italy, was also spreading in all the foreign chancelleries or colonies like Tunisia or the Levant. Here, a different variety of Italian was in use. As Testa points out, it is almost impossible for the linguists to trace unique and specific traits due to the too many linguistic forces which contribute to the formation of the Levant Italian. Within this context, the only way one has for characterizing what the language among dragomans as well as the language in the, medic in the um, uh, world corpus was is to understand the why, to whom, where and when the text was written as well as to focus on its contents. These factors become crucial for recognizing those social identity markers which are manifested both in the language and in the form through which it is expressed. The writing and those which allow us to interpret and motivate the linguistic variation. Considering this, I would like to conclude with Rotman's words saying that since dragomans epitomize trans-imperial subjects whose carrier paths and kinship and patronage networks crossed political and social boundaries between empires, between Venetian citizens and colonial subjects, as well as between different states within metropolitan Venetian society, we have to assume that the dragomans' linguistic behavior and their writing should be considered within the perspective of the community of practice of better as where Dragomans are um, a community of practice where the dragomans are an aggregate of people who come together around mutual engagement in an endeavor represented by ways of doing things, ways of talking, beliefs, values, powers, in short, practices. Thank you. I'm finished. <laughs> Yeah, maybe. Kristen, is there any evidence that they that they knew each other and that they communicated with each other? Oh, these dragomans? Yeah, like the, the these five that I consider no. I mean, obviously, the brothers. Yeah, the brothers them. obviously communicate, but the the previous three they didn't communicate because Chivrani was the first one. Then when he, di he died, Membre became the second dragoman. The Norris was the third one. So. They are, I forgot to tell this one, that Chivrani was the first in absolute and he was recognized as a dragoman only later, right. not, uh, not when he so started to be an interpreter. So in that sense, is that a community of practice then? Um, where, I mean, I mean, not a proper social linguist but to look at people in this room who know much better than me, but um, my understanding as a community of practice is a bunch of people who basically doing similar kind of things yeah. synchronically. So it's not the case that it's over a period of time. Yeah, it's, uh, the, the thing is that I gave uh, this community of practice interpretation because here I presented five dragomans, but I worked on text which are synchronically in the same period. So for 16th century, I don't, uh, I don't have only Chivran and Membre or in the 17th century, it's only the Norris and Tarsia. Here I bring, uh, I brought five dragomans, but I have um, looked into, I mean, I have looked for these traits in the world corpus that it wasn't only for dragomans and also from other dragomans which are contemporaneous to some of uh, Membre and some others to Tarsia, like, uh, I don't know, Niccolo Cambi or other, other dragomans. Yeah, there was. They had to learn how to do this kind of activity. Uh, there was a training program um, in which were involved those dragomans uh, which belonged to the Venetian community, because uh, there were some. Uh, I mean, there was a project in the 16th century of opening a school called La Scuola dei Giovani di Lingua of Young of Languages, in Venice because they wanted to teach languages, the Arabic, Persian, I mean, the languages of the Ottoman Empire to them. And uh, um, however, in Venice, this project didn't work very well. So what they used to do was to send Venetian young people to the Levant to learn the language. While in France, 
these schools worked m much better than, uh, than in Italy. So this, this is the only thing I know about a common training of these people. And the, what they do when they were sent to the Levant, they used to spend uh, their life among men within uh, the um, Bailo household that, were, that was their residency where they, f they were formed. So they learned the language through a Kotsa, that he was a teacher of the Tur uh, Turkish or Arabic language. And then they, some of them, they went back to Venice and they worked there in this um, connection as intermediaries uh, in the connection with Ottomans. And uh, well, this is the, the only thing that I know. So they, they, what they have, they shared the same place. They, they were formed in the same way. And um, the idea of community of practice, um, I thought about that. And uh, at the beginning, I thought about a social act for dragomans because uh, they, um, not only because of the aesthetic uh, value that they were all similar and they wanted to be identified as dragomans, but also because at a stylistic, uh, from a stylistic point of view, these documents, what they share is how they open the letters, how they close the letters, how they, um, um, they, um, uh, they point out the date for which they have the Arabic and the Italian uh, version of the date. It's a, a, a reply to your question. I think what you, you've explained much more clearly why you use that particular term. But I mean, this, you have to help me articulate <laughs> this. But my, my understanding is that community of practice isn't formalized in any sense. It's not like you have any training going on or whatever. It's a it's something that yeah, spread. Mm -hmm. We call them a community of practice. So my, my understanding is these people don't, not they're not together and they're you know, in the same sort of practice. They are? They're not engaged in the same kind of practice. They're engaged in doing translation and different <coughs> yeah. stuff. The, the, the thing is that among dragomans there are, as, as I tried to tell, maybe I wasn't clear, there are three different kinds of dragomans. These are all dragomans who were trained inside the school, so they were Venetian sent to the Levant, and those were trained inside the school, where they spent their many years of their life, at least eight, ten years there, living among themselves and with the Sultan. Then there were, there were those dragomans who just became dragomans because they knew the languages. So they had learned, for example, uh, Chivran and Membre, they were not formed in the school, they had learned the language. The Chivrana because uh, was uh, captured by Turks when he was a child. The Norris was captured by Turks when he was a child. For this reason, they had learned the language and they had learned the costumes and the cultures of Ottomans. While the, um, the Tarsias brothers, they were formed inside the school. They were sent to study these languages. So they, they are different uh, typology of, uh, of dragomans. And, the, uh, and the, in, in, the, um, in the translation of, uh, of the documents, of the text, I mean, they, what they say, uh, when I say about the stylistic way in which they translated the documents, it was something that arose among them. I mean, at least I, I don't have any uh, evidence uh, which say that uh, it was taught how to open a letter, how to close a letter, how to mark the date, how to, de to refer to the doge or how to refer to the sultan. And what it's more interesting is that when they were writing, I mean, then when they were translating uh, the uh, documents and they wanted to be, um, uh, they wanted to please the address, the addressee, they used some specific formula towards the doge. And they, when they wanted to be firm and say, no, you invaded my land, I'm going to give you a battle. So they use another form. So in this sense, I, I thought that the, community of practice um, concept could be applied. It's a... Uh, I, I, I was just going to mention the, the pictures you showed us shows a group of them all together. So that mm -hmm. suggests a community of practice somehow. Uh, they, they were hanging around all of them. 
the, the, that yeah. Yeah, Ottoman. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Ottoman and Turkish. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, it was Ottoman Turkish. Yeah. And when, uh, in the, for example, in Divenire um, collection, whenever you uh, you have uh, the document written in uh, the Oriental languages, uh, it's called is referred as Ottoman. Yeah. So it's uh, it's it was the Ottoman Turkish, of course. Yeah. And uh, I mean, in, uh, what the, um, what I would like to have uh, is to be able to accede to the original document, that one written in uh, Ottoman or in uh, Arabic or in Greek, in order to compare what uh, what it was written there originally and what they translated. But I don't know those languages so like this. <laughs> Yeah, even, for example, related to this, um, in the correspondence that the Bailo sent to Venice, uh, many times they complained because, I mean, when they were talking about the project of a school of a Giovanni di Lingua in Venice, it was because the Bailo was complaining by the fact that these young people, they used to learn the language through the Cozza. That was the teacher, and they say explicitly that the Cozza used to tell them uh, to teach them the colloquial variety. So they were not able to write properly. This is what the bylo uh, say. Many bylaws com were complaining about this issue. For this reason, they thought about a project where other dragomans, which were already well formed and had learned the high variety, could teach the others. But it never worked uh, very well. Can I ask you about the transcription? Um, it's a really work from copies of the manuscripts. I mean, um, I mean, I'm guessing it's quite difficult to read the stuff. Yeah, it's really difficult. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I translated my English kind of documents from about 50 years ago, and it's actually <laughs> maybe a bit longer ago than that. But it's, it's really difficult to, to read. You have, and you always need, you need to know what they're saying. Yeah, that is, I totally agree. I mean, we, I think that uh, we cannot be, uh, we cannot be sure uh, at 100%, but I have checked the translation, uh, I mean, my transcriptions with the, with the paleograph. Uh, he went, a paleograph, he went through the whole text again. And he, I mean, what I had uh, transcribed, it was, Confirmed apart from apart some few things, but um, especially this L E L I, yeah. it was uh, particularly checked for this reason. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. Well, it's really interesting. Um, I mean, I think you What, the, what I wanted to say is that, um, I mean, this, uh, the variation that can be observed since the variation moved towards a variety of languages instead of another one, so towards to be more Venetian or to, more Tuscan, that um, to uh, consider it as um, a kind of identity marker in the sense that whenever they, they were involved in a relation, direct relationship with the Doge, um, they used to um, uh, to refer uh, things uh, through a variety of language closer to that one of the doge. Mm. I don't know if a, a kind of accommodation, but not. But I don't want to say that this was a, con a conscious accommodation because what they had both 
the language, uh, both the language in their um, in their knowledge. I mean, they had uh, the uh, both of the varieties. So it's uh, whenever because it, this is what I noticed that whenever I was uh, looking into texts that were not translation, these uh, more Venetian threads appeared more than in the other documents and the other typology of documents, so that the typology of document, the content of the document, and the person that should have received the documents could have an impact on the um, ling uh, linguistic variation, this was what I was saying. Can you say it again? Sorry. It could be misregistered because the addresses were, I mean, the letters were uh, very formal, let's say. So it was for a very, you know, VIP group of people. So maybe that's why, rather than identity. Yeah, but and what about if the addressee is always the same? And you have this variation with the same addressee? I mean, this um, when I say to the um, the documents who were sent to uh, to the Doge, um, if I take into consideration uh, Membre or Chivran, uh, the the Doge is always the same. When he's going to make to write the translation and when he was saying, saying uh, sending him his report, the, the addressee is the same. But you have this variation between the two. Uh, typology of text. So for this reason, I, I mean, I took the um, into consideration the typology of text as a possible uh, parameter. So I don't know if. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to you. Thanks.